Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you are new here. My name is Janelle and I make both faith-based and lifestyle content here on YouTube. Today we are finally going to wrap up my James Bible study series with chapter 5. This was supposed to be filmed a while ago, but better late than never, right? Before I get started, I did test positive for COVID yesterday and this is the first time I've ever had COVID that I know of. I had a fever yesterday. Fever is gone now, so that's good. I had chills. I set my house to 82 degrees and I was freezing. I had a sweater on, so that tells you something. I'm not feeling great, but nothing makes you feel better like the word of God, am I right? So chapter five is broken up into three different parts. Part one focuses on the rich. If you've heard the saying, it's harder for the rich to get into heaven, we're gonna talk about that. Second section is going to be how to have patience and suffering. The book of Job in the Old Testament is all about having patience and suffering. So now we see here James in the New Testament talk about the same thing. And the last is prayer for the sick. We're going to get started. Usually I don't read an entire passage. I go through some highlights, but this first section, warning to the rich, I'm going to read all of it because every verse is critical to get this point across. So we're going to start right at verse one. Come now, you rich, weep and cry aloud over the miseries that are coming on you. Your riches have rotted and your clothing has become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you. It will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have hoarded treasure. Let's pause there. So those were verses one through three. And if you've heard that saying, it is harder for the rich to get into heaven. Actually, my pastor just said Sunday, intelligence and wealth are two things that can really hinder your faith. Doesn't mean it will, but you know, those people that have a lot of intelligence, not a bad thing, but it's harder for them to understand the concept of God, believe it or not. It's those who are poor, and unfortunately, I don't want to say less educated, but it's them who really have the faith. They don't question it. They hear what they don't see and they believe. And I think that's a beautiful thing, you know? But the same thing goes for wealth and money. When you have it all, it's hard for you to not place importance on those things, especially when you feel like you've earned it. You feel like you've worked so hard to acquire all these goods here on earth. Selfishness starts to build up and pride, which we learned about in chapter four. So now we're seeing the rich will have their time if they continue to boast and be selfish and cling on to their worldly treasures, the time will come where that will all disappear, where their fine clothing will rot, where their gold and silver will rust, where their treasures just won't matter. It's so sad, the last verse, it is in the last days that you have hoarded treasure. That is like the opposite of what we wanna do in the last days. I like to live every day like we're in the last days, like Jesus could come back today. I don't wanna cling on to the things that I have that are just not important. This passage right here is a warning to release that bond to your items, to your treasures, to your nice clothes, to your nice jewelry. It's okay to have those things, but don't make those things idols. Don't place so much value in things. Verse four, look, the pay you have held back from the workers who mowed your fields cries out against you, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have lived indulgently and luxuriously on the earth. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, although he does not resist you. So again, this passage is not just for people that have abundance and necessarily have wealth. There are plenty of people who are followers of Christ that the Lord have has just given them in abundance, but their mind is set on God. It's not set on the things around them. They might you know, earn a lot of money in a job, but they're using that money and storing it wisely to grow the kingdom of God, to give to the poor, to do the right things and realize that God has entrusted them as managers of this money, but they're not the owners. It's not all me. They're not filled and consumed with greed. But this passage is for those who are living indulgently and luxuriously on this earth, for those who are not paying their workers fairly. We see that in huge corporations all the time. You see these workers that are, you know, at the operational level working tirelessly who don't receive a fair wage. And we see the big boss that's reaping benefits. Their time will come. Those who have condemned and murdered the righteous person, those who treat the poor and ignore them and just treat them poorly. So this is a big warning to not live a greedy, selfish, materialistic, luxurious life. 
It is not beautiful in the eyes of God, okay? All you're doing is filling a hole and trying to impress other people. We don't need that. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on to the second section. It's called Patience and Suffering. Verse seven. So be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's return. Think of how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the ground and is patient for it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient and strengthen your hearts for the Lord's return is near. Yeah, this is a good one too because I think about when I see something that I want for myself and I want it right now. I don't want to take the time to learn how to do it or understand the struggle and the process. I can think of a couple things, right? Like it could be something as simple as learning to play an instrument and I, I want to know right away. I don't want to take the steps to try to learn it. I just want to pick it up and know how to play. Like that's just not the way it works. Same thing, I always use my job as an example because that is what I'm currently struggling with. It's what I, the area of my life where I don't feel content. So I see a vision for myself of what I want to do and what my ideal work life looks like and I want to get there right now. I keep thinking, well, my time on this earth is so short, but you know how many people feel that way? Like so many people that are living at or below the poverty line that all they want is enough food on their table for the week. And I just want the end goal right now. And that's just not the way to be because as I've learned time and time again in church, being comfortable is a lot of people's goal. It's like, I wanna live a comfortable life. And that's what I would pray all the time to God. And I was like, God, I'm not asking to be rich. I'm not asking for that top job or the biggest YouTube channel or anything like that. I just wanna be comfortable. And I kept praying that prayer. And I've been going back and forth between two different churches and I finally found the church that I'm really a part of. I heard at both of those churches that living comfortably is not a good thing because it is in our comfort that we don't, we don't grow. We grow in the struggle. That's when we work hard and we learn and we mature and we seek the Lord and we gain wisdom. That is when we start to grow. So if I want to live comfortably right now today and just live like that for the rest of my life, that's kind of boring. And the Lord wants me to grow. He obviously wants me to grow. And so I need to have patience in the suffering. And all of this to say is that sometimes we don't see the whole big picture, but God does. We need to learn how to be content and patient with where we're at. Even when we're suffering, even when we're going through a hard time, strengthen our hearts that the Lord's return is near. I don't know if Jesus will come back during my lifetime. I don't think so. I feel like everybody says that though. Whether he does or doesn't, at the end of my time here on earth, none of this that I'm stressing about, anxious about, impatient about, none of it matters. And think about the farmer. Think about how the farmer plants the seed and it takes a while to grow. Don't you think when he first became a farmer, he wanted to see those results right away and start making the money? Things take time and we don't always know how much time and I think that's the part that scares us but that's where we need to rely on God like we might not know when or if something's going to work out having that firm foundation as long as you are solid like a rock it doesn't matter how the wind blows as long as your faith is firm in God in any circumstance no matter what you're dealing with in life that will help you stay patient and then they even mention Job think of how we regard as blessed those who have endured you have heard of Job's endurance and you have seen the Lord's purpose that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy and and above all, do not swear either by heaven or earth or by any oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall into judgment. That's just a reminder of when you do go through suffering and you endure that because your foundation is firm and you're not letting the circumstances of the world affect your faith, affect your attitude, you will be blessed by the Lord. Those who endure are regarded as blessed. Those who endure hard times and stay firm we'll see the kingdom of heaven. As we see, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He is our friend. <laughs> and I do think about this verse a lot. A lot of people are like, why don't Christians curse? Why is it really that bad? It's just a word. Well, we learned in chapter three, taming the tongue. Here, let your yes be yes, no be no. Do not swear by heaven or earth. There's just no need to do that. People do it for emphasis, but that is not pure speech. And if people don't believe you, let them be, right? Let them go on their way. I don't know how that ties into patience and suffering, but that just goes to show you that I don't, I don't know at all. I don't know why that verse is in here. If anybody knows how that ties into patience, then let me know. All right, so now we're going on to the third section, which is called prayer for the sick. And it talks about if anybody you know around you is currently suffering. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you ill? He should summon the elders of the church and they should pray for him and anoint him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. Well, this actually reminds me of the book of Daniel. Daniel, he's just so, so good. He prays to the Lord 
in, during bad times, and he expresses gratitude and is so thankful to the Lord when he sees good. So he ties the good and the bad back to focus on Christ, because it's not just in the bad where we want to reach out to God. I lived a life like that, and a lot of people do, you know, in lukewarm Christianity, it's like when you're going through something tough, that's when you pray. That's when you want God. But when you're good, you kind of forget about it. And that's not the way it should be. That is just so sad. The way we treat the one who's given us life, the one who puts like breath in our lungs, like for us to not be thankful every day that we have eyes to see and ears to hear. If we're in good spirits, we should sing praises, worship to him. It feels so good. Like the way that I just weep when I like sing a worship song to God alone in my room, like it is powerful. I think it really allows your faith to grow when you feel God's presence in the room, in the room during good times. When someone's sick, Pray for them. That's something that I thought about too when I was getting into a relationship. I'm like, I need to make sure that I'm with somebody who when I'm sick, like we will pray together. Or if somebody else is sick, that we pray together. There is so much power in praying as a group as well. Then moving down to the end of the chapter and the end of the book, verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wander wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, he should know that the one who turns a sinner back from his wandering path will save that person's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is so big. I have seen how the power of prayer truly works. And if somebody starts wandering away from the faith and all you do is start talking about that person, like, oh my gosh, they left the faith so sad. What good is that doing for that person? You see that by bringing them back to the faith, you are saving a soul from eternal death. That's not a joke. Whether the approach is to talk to that person directly or to pray for them behind closed doors, you work that out with God, maybe a little bit of both, plant little seeds and go pray. That is our purpose, is to enhance the kingdom of God, to increase the number of people in the kingdom of God. If somebody in your life is starting to question the faith that was previously in the faith, like above all, pray for them. If it's someone you love and care for, it's easy for you. And if it's somebody who maybe you don't really care for, maybe it's not. But let's go back to that basic question of what would Jesus do? I'm trying to live my life that way. Now that I am watching The Chosen and seeing like a character of Jesus, just like seeing the way he responds, it's giving me a clearer picture. It's making me want to be so much softer, so much kinder. When Jesus needs to be alone and somebody just approaches him, he doesn't say, hey, leave me alone. I need to be alone right now. Like he is so welcoming every time. I just strive to be more like that and we can know all of this and still struggle to be in communication with God because of how busy our lives are. You know, I feel that way a lot. Like sometimes all I have time for is a night prayer before bed. That might be the same repetitive prayer that I've prayed all week. And that is not enough. I'm speaking to you guys, but I'm speaking to myself too. The power of prayer is so real. God knows what we need before we ask him, but he wants us to be in communication with him. That is the end of James. I hope you got something out of these videos. I'm going to have the other four linked below so you can watch chapters one through four if you haven't yet. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I am so thankful for each and every one of you. Like my subscriber count has grown quite a bit over the last couple months, so thank you, thank you. When I shifted my content to more faith-focused content, all I really wanted was like one person to say that this video helped them. And I just love the comments that I get from you guys because they're so real. It's like, this is what I'm going through with the Lord. And they're so important. Like they're about you know, like your lives or your prayers or, you know, it's not just like, hey, I love your outfit. Where'd you get it? Like I think about my old content and how I was posting outfit videos and what I ate today and like my gym routine. And like, I just don't care about any of that stuff right anymore. I love that the Lord has helped me find direction and I appreciate all of you for being here listening to me. So let me know what other videos you want to see if you have any questions and I'll see you next time with another video. Bye.